Good morning. This is the Blaine's World webcast that can be found each week on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. You can also find us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You get more information and listen to previous shows at our website, which is behind me, blainesworld.net. I'm your host, Blaine Greenfield, here in my Zoom studio in lovely downtown Fairview, North Carolina. And you'll have to excuse me the appearance, but I had a fall recently, so I'm a little bruised, but hopefully you can at least hear me. Each week, we focus on positive news and information about people and organizations in both Western North Carolina and throughout the country. And to that end, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Virginia Watts, who's a poet and writer. And Virginia, you can feel free to wave to all your fans and friends who are watching this. Hey, everyone. Okay, and that's Virginia. And you're located where, Virginia, when we're speaking? I live in uh, Wayne, Pennsylvania, which is near Villanova. Okay, and Virginia Watts is in the publishing world. She's an award-winning author of poetry and prose. Her work has appeared in over 100 literary journals. She's been nominated four times for a Pushcart Prize and named Best of the Net four times. Very cool. She's published two poetry uh, books and was part of a poetry collaborative book and recently published a collection of short stories entitled Echoes from the Hawker House. Is that it? That's it. And that was named one of the best independent books of 2023. So what I always ask the first time I meet somebody, Virginia, is in terms of um, how you got into what you're doing. And so as a child, did you grow up in Pennsylvania as well? I grew up in uh, Hershey, Pennsylvania. And my my family, my both of my parents were from rural areas uh, of Pennsylvania as children. So um, that's where I grew up. I one of those kids that started kindergarten in one school and graduated in the same school. So I, I thought that was kind of a blessing, you so know, to, to have a hometown. When you were growing up in Pennsylvania outside Hershey, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? I always loved to write. I always dreamed I could be a writer. Uh, I don't know that I knew I could be, um, but I always wished I, I could. So I guess you did pretty well in English and those kinds of subjects. I, I was kind of a nerd, yes. Okay, well. <laughs> but I did okay in a lot of, I, 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 I liked school. I was one of the, I couldn't wait for, for school to start in the fall. And I hated for it to end. I was one of those children that loved to be in the classroom. Um, but definitely writing was my favorite thing. Do you remember the very first poem you ever wrote? Um, I don't remember the first poem I ever wrote, but I remember writing a little short story in the fifth grade. And I had a, a, a teacher who would let me stay in from recess and I would sit there. And I remember it was something about a little girl that ate peanut butter and peas. And I don't remember. I wish I had the story today, but I clearly remember the smell of the classroom, the kids outside, you know, laughing and playing. And I'm sitting there writing a story, but I was perfectly content. <laughs> well, that's a challenge for you. So you go back now and rewrite this story, you know. So you I, can, I've thought about that. I've thought uh, about that. But it just sounds, it'd be a great idea for a story as a short story. You know, it sounds like a, a great, a kid's, or that's your next book, your kid's book about yeah. that. Wouldn't that be a fun thing to It recreate? would be a fun thing. I would, I love children's literature. I, I would love to try it sometime. But especially to revisit your first story, you know. It's just Yeah, I, and I've I, thought about that story over the years, all my life. So maybe you're onto something. I shouldn't let, let it go. I well, I'm asking you. And so that'll be next time you're on the show. We'll talk about, and you can read the read this book. Yeah, and I, that'd be a great idea. You got me interested in it. So you wrote as fifth grader. You remember that story and you went to high school. Um, did you continue writing uh, poems and short stories? You know, I, I kind of got off track and I, I went to college and it was in the seventies. And my father said, you know, writing is fun, but you need to have a career. Right. So I, it was, the, it was the oil, it was the energy crisis times. And so practically I went and became, I, I had to have an accounting degree, which I, I did fine with, but I absolutely hated it. So I graduated and I thought I can't stand the idea of being an accountant. So I went to law school. And I graduated from law school. I became a lawyer and I did a lot of research and writing type of law jobs. Um, and I just then I had children and then I got my life, you know, how life goes. And I've said this to young women over the years a lot. You know, my husband traveled a lot. He was away a lot. I stayed home and was, the, you know, with the children was wonderful. But, you know, I kind of said, you know, someday I'll get writing. Someday I'll go back to writing. I'm just too busy now. So I waited till I was 50 to really give it a go, which I wish I hadn't. But um, 
because I had to take a lot of courses and classes and catch up and everything. Uh, and I tell younger, I, I see young women at conferences and, and I say, do it, even though you're busy and, and you're here at this, that's great. Even though you're busy, do it even now as you're young. Don't wait like I did to, to push it all till the end. So that's so, so one of my life regrets. Well, but the nice thing about it is you're never too late to revisit it, you know, and, and yep. your story is a great example. So yeah. you then eventually gave up, were you a practicing attorney at one time? I was a clerk for, uh, on this Pennsylvania Superior Court judge, and then for the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. I was uh, a law clerk, which basically meant sure. that I was drafting, drafting opinions and working the library, which was my kind of thing, you know. But when I when I started to have children, I and I my my husband was gone so much, and we didn't live near any family to really help with the children. I thought, well, you know, this is a chance to 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 be to be with them and enjoy their their growing up years. And it was I have no regrets about that, of course. But I could have found some time for some some story writing in there, if I'm honest. So, what got you back into the writing? Uh. You know, I think my children didn't need me as much anymore. They were they were going to college and 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 I thought, well, what am I going to do now? So I I thought, well, let me take some classes. So I started with some adult classes at night. And then I started at a local university. Um I started taking some some writing classes. Then I started like a mad woman and I went to every <laughs> workshop, getaway. I mean, you name it. I was there learning about the the craft of writing because, you, you know, I didn't really I, I had no educational background out of high school in writing. So I spent a good five years just killing myself, cramming as much information and, and learning from from people as I could. Uh, and then eventually I just started writing and I wrote and wrote and wrote. And so I started to submit and it took a couple of years for something to be accepted. I think three years before something was accepted, but like anything in, in the world, once you sort of get the ball rolling, if somebody sees, well, sh this person published her, maybe I should take a chance. You know, you get a little traction. So I was able to, you know, publish like quite a lot in literary journals, which I love to do because I think literary journals are important. Let me ask you in terms of giving advice to other would be writers out there. Um, is this something that you do like every day? Do you now, when you wake up in the morning, get up at 5.30 in the morning and work <laughs> right for three hours straight? What's yeah. your writing style? I think every writer has a different writing style. You know, some people really stick to a schedule. I I love it so much that if I have a moment in, in, of every day, in every day where no one needs me or it's peaceful, I'll just scamper up to that laptop and work on what I'm working on. I My only thing is that I usually work on one thing at once. I have one story going or one poem. I don't like a lot of things. I like to finish, you know, put them away and start on the next. It's just how how I process it. Yeah. It works for you. So right now, for example, what are you working on? Right now, it's it's I was just talking to this about some of my writing friends. I am I drafted a story written in the 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 viewpoint and of a robot. It's a robot in the future. And the earth has been destroyed for, from what he can tell, except he's he's found one small life form. And he's a funny robot. He's kind of a <laughs> quirky, almost a little bit cocky robot. But he gets himself together and he goes in search of this little life form and he's gonna find it's a little boy. And so I'm 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 just trying to look into the future and, and see some some something we don't know yet how'd you come up with that idea i don't i'm not sure i you know i'm fascinated by i went on the on, on a search the other day of the of the humanoid robots that they're developing and if you've ever seen them they're very lifelike but not really you know because when they talk like they talk and they try to mimic but sometimes their vo their forehead gets stuck up here and you're like well that's not normal and you know they don't turn they have a face so I, I'm, I'm just so um, interested in the technology of robots. And I, so that got me saying, well, I should write, I should write something told by in the viewpoint and the, the voice of a robot. So you're working on the story. How long will it take you to finish it, do you see? When I start to draft a story, that's the scariest part because I only start with a little spark of an idea like this one. This is typical for me. 
and I'll start writing and I try to get about a 5,000 word story because that's usually enough. And my scary part is I start and I think, I just hope I can get to an end with this. I hope I can make this into something. What if it goes nowhere? That's a fear of mine. And so the first draft part is pretty quick because I want to get through that hell zone. I just want to get there. So maybe it'll take me four days working on and off to draft it. The next step is to kind of work it again. And then I take it to uh, my my critique, critique writing group, which meets on Monday nights. Um, and this is run, I've been doing this for years. Allison Hicks is a poet from Philadelphia who has beautiful poetry books of her own, but she has this workshop, Philadelphia workshop. And um, it's 13 of us and they're all amazing writers. And we meet, um, we have three sessions a year and you can pr put a manuscript in for a critique. And this is a group that tells you like it is. And they have, the reason that, you know, I was, I was, able to even get these stories was because of this group of people that spend time telling you what works and what doesn't. And it's hard at first because you love, you think this, I thought it was working, but they'll say, we have no idea what you're talking about in this <laughs> section of the story, you know? So um, a big shout out to, to Allison Hicks and all the people there who've helped each other along the way. I think writers are learning that like everybody else since the pandemic. We need each other. You know, we need community of writers is important. Um, you can't do it on your own, you need help. So the next step is to face the critique. Don't, don't get down about it and go back and fix what didn't work the first time around. That can take about 50 rewrites, honestly. Then I send it to the one, my one friend, uh, Susan, it's in the group and she's my final reader that if, if she finds nothing else and signs off and says, this is okay, then I submit it. Now, let me ask you this in terms of this one group. Um, so this is all done via Zoom or remotely? We meet, you know, we meet live during, oh, nice. during COVID. We did have Zoom, but we meet, we have, we have a live group that meets. Okay. And, and we start, <clears throat> excuse me, with a, Allison will give us a prompt. And so we'll do some prompt writing. And we read that. If you if you want to, you can read what you wrote. And then we say what well, worked for us because these are these are new writings. And then we take a break. And sometimes Allison will give us submission ideas or she'll talk about a, a point of craft because she's an MFA and she teaches us about different points of craft and writing. And then the last hour or so is the critique session of your manuscript that they've read for that week. They've had it for a week. They read it. And they've written written all over it, and they they're going to now tell you honestly what they think of it, and they give you positive things, but you know they tell you the truth about what you need to do because I think people don't understand how much work goes into getting the final short story or the final poem or the final novel done. There's so much to do um, with redrafting and editing to make it the best it can be. As a writer, is that tough to hear people uh, critique your stuff or, you know, you know critical it, of it, it? It was at first. It was, it was, it was at first, but what I learned quickly was if I opened my heart to it and I really dug in and I, and I don't, I don't, I don't do everything everyone suggests, but it, you know what happens with a writer is you kind of know deep down that like that ending really didn't work, but you think you're going to get away with it. <laughs> the problem is that really good writers know that. And they're telling you, know, this writing, this ending, this is not the right ending. This doesn't even, we don't believe it. We don't believe it. That's the worst thing you can hear. And you know in your heart that you didn't believe it either, but you couldn't come up with anything else. So you put it down there. But uh, that's why critique groups and communities, like in all forms of life, you need people. People need each other to be better people. And talk about, I think this, you mentioned, uh, this is one group you're in. You're also in another group, I believe, with a friend of mine. And I'm in a similar group with with Rodney Richards, who's a who's also a poet, a wonderful poet. And it's it's a group that meets, we we meet Sunday morning. It's like, a, we, we think it's our church. And it's a, it's a group of seven. It's now eight. We've included somebody new. And it's the same format somewhat, where we get together. We just get together and share poems, though. Um, and we help each other critique honestly the same thing. But recently we did something fun 
where we we got together, we published a collective of poems where everyone contributed some poems. And our 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 poetry is so diverse that it's a fun book because you get a little taste of everyone. And the book is called Circle the Circle of Seven because there was seven of, of us at the time. It's available um, on Amazon. And that was a really fun experience. It was fun to and to do that. And actually, the the publishers of of this um, short story collection, uh, Devil's Parties Press, they have also um, I'm also part of Old Scratch Press, which is, which is another poetry collective. And there, uh, this is a little bit different. This is a collective where we everyone wants to publish an individual collection, but we read and edit and look edit each other's book, then we try to um, help them market it through our, and so it's, it's, it's fun in the, in the, and you don't feel like you're alone in the world trying to first complete your, your, your book. And second, now what do I do with it? You know, who's going to buy it? How do I tell people about it? So that's a new, new um, idea. I see more collective, collective things happening in writing. And I think that's a good thing. And that's something I should point out that a lot of people seem to forget you know they they write the book and then they say i get this all the time with um performers and artists you know they say mm -hmm. well their job is not to market it but unless you market it get the word out being on the being on the planes world webcast you know right that's it you have to what, try, you have to get once you write it then then you're in the next phase and you have to try to let people know that it's out there let me ask you this question too i was worried about writers so you have all these bunch of short stories you've done poems where does the title come into play? Is that, do you come up with it before you begin or after or during? Yeah. Titles are, are important, especially in poems. I think titles are extremely right. important. I think of all things, like if I just talk about poetry, I think that's the thing I change the most is probably the title. Because a poem will start some way and I'll put up, I'll, you know, I'll slap a little title up there, you know. But the poem will take the poem will take you where it wants where it wants you to go, and you'll end where you didn't expect to be, which is true of all writing, for me at least. And then you'll look back at that title and you think, well, that doesn't even make any sense. There's nothing to do with what this poem ended up being about. But you want to, I think, with a poem, you want people to be interested. Like, well, that that's an interesting title. You know, you don't want to say, you know a bird you want, <laughs> you want you know what i mean <laughs> you want somebody to say let's me why should i read this poem right do you so, ever go back after you've written something and want to change it or edit it or do you ever do that all the time like, every time it i it, it's a haunting thing i try not to do because <laughs> i think you're never really it's never really going to be perfect but and I always I try not to look back at anything I've published because I'm like oh I could change that it would be better if I did this you know well, that would be second edition or revi revision. Yeah, or I think it's just better to move forward. You know, that's the thing. Okay, something else. And talk about moving forward. So let's now talk a little bit about, I guess, the, the book project you held up and held it up again. But what was yeah. the idea behind that? So this is a collection this of- This is the book. Yeah, this is a collection of 15 short stories of mine. Um, and it was published, like I said, it was published by Devil's Party Press, the two- People there, Dave and Diane. Uh, Diane Pierce is they're they're a couple, married couple. Uh, they live in California now. She's a wonderful editor, and they they were the nicest people to work with as publishers. They were generous. They were kind. They're writers themselves, um, encouraging. They when they originally accepted my book, they had. Um, look, they were looking for submissions of authors that were over a certain age of like, like the age of 40, because I, there's this feeling sort of in the publishing area where youth is, is kind of uh, favored a bit. And their idea was, you know, are we want our press to focus on, on older writers that haven't, that have, that have a lot of life that they've lived more life and maybe their writing has more, more different things to say. I'm not saying youthful writing isn't, you know, but, valuable. But in your case, though, they made an exception to allow a, youth, <laughs> a younger writer. Right? Oh, I wish. Don't I? Well, I wish. No. By the way, you held it up. That's kind of a, a cool title too. Echoes from what's it? Hawker. Yeah, House? Echoes from the Hawker House. So this is like, this is one of the, one of the stories in here is, is about the Hawker House, which is a fictional story from a neighborhood set in suburban America and the Hawker House is is a house on the block, and the kids are afraid of it because strange things go on in the Hawker House. Like one night, it was a Halloween trick or treat night, and one house and window in the house went red, 
So the, it's a little bit of a mystery house. So it's uh, the title is kind of, you know, piggy banking off of, of, that, of that story. Anything from your past in, in that story or the book itself? Do you bring in like the hot? No, house? there's there's settings in here. There's there's maybe characters that are loosely drawn, but it's, it's these are really made up stories. These are these are fictional stories that that I that my, they're from my imagination, and that's a fun yeah. part of it. And you mentioned when we were talking before off the air that um, in terms of the, the stories you write, so you've written these stories, but you've also done nonfiction. You said in another part yeah. of your life. You've done mm -hmm. poems as well, first book. Do you have preferences to what kind of writing you like doing best? I think, you know, I've had, I think this happens, I'm not unusual in this. I think when people start writing, they write a lot about their own lives, their own stories, things that they want to talk about. <clears throat> After a while, that gets a bit boring. You're thinking, I'm so, I don't care about <laughs> myself anymore. And so you, st and I've, I've found it a lot more fun as this book was to, venture into make-believe to to make up stories you know it it's it's fun it's it, it to me it's more um it elevates you out of your own day uh you know and i like i i think we were mentioning you and i were speaking about i really enjoy um science fiction stories and magical realism i've had uh two um science fiction stories published by a, a group out of london england and um, that's available on my website. You have access to see where those published. Where they, way, they are. Let me jump in here since you mentioned. What is your website? Who would? So you can find me at it's Virginia Watts all lowercase dot com, and that's my website. And if you type that in, you'll see uh, all my books. Um, they are mentioned. My background, some excerpts of my writing, and all my books are uh, available on Amazon, you know, Barnes and Noble, and you can and, link right there. And you mentioned, so Virginia Watts, it's with two T's, is that correct? It is, yeah. Okay. And what's um interesting also, we were talking off the air, uh, if I can ask you just the origin of that name. So that's now your, your pen name. And how did right. you come up with that pen name? So my maiden name is Watts, and my father is one of those characters in my life that he was so special to me and everybody loved my father. His name was Ralph Watts. And uh, so I've written a lot about him. He was just a wonderful man, uh, funny and just, just generous and kind. He's the sweetest person ever. So I thought when I was going to try to do some writing, I thought, you know, if I ever publish anything, I'd really like it to be in my father's name. So I decided to um, keep my maiden name for my pen name. And then when I wrote this book, um, in the beginning of it, um, I dedicated, I, I say for my father, Ralph F. Watts, whose belief in me was unfailing. And so I, I you know, he's not around anymore, but um, I wanted to do this for him. Very sweet. Something else he just said before was kind of interesting, I found, about uh, people writing about themselves. Yeah. And it reminds me of um, when I'm... I enjoy his writing, Asimov, you know. And so talking about writers, you know, what, 750 books he wrote, you know, something along those lines. But the, the story I tell is that, so I want to know more about his life, right? I go to read his autobiography. And it was fascinating how he started writing. And I knew I was in trouble that he wrote, it was a three-part autobiography, you know. And it was like, I stopped reading after the first volume. It was 750 pages from the time he was born to the age of 18, you know, oh and I said, gosh. you know, no offense to asthma, but that's, yeah. that's a little too much for me, you that's know, about his life. Yeah. you know, talking about science fiction, whatnot, but can you imagine three volumes of an no. autobiography, but no, he, he could put out a lot of different stuff. This book, go back to it, if you would, uh, could you give uh, listeners or viewers a hint of kind of what kind of book is it? So um, is it, there, yeah. there are 15 short stories, and yeah, what... there it's there's 15 short stories. Um, they they're 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 set mostly in rural settings, not all of them. Um, and they're they're there's it's about normal life, but there's always a little bit there's a, something unexpected. And there's a tinge of dark. There's a tinge of darkness here. Something that you don't expect. Um, Kirkus reviews. This is the way they describe it: entrancing, edgy, and melodramatic tales with a palatable bite. And that's kind of that's kind of how they they saw it. And there's there's 15, 15 stories, which is nice about short stories. You can pick one up, 
you can read it. It doesn't take that much time, put it down. And then when you have time again, it, it's a nice way to, to be reading something. If you're busy, you know, you don't have to keep up with the whole novel. So unlike your writing, you don't have to start on page one. I mean, you don't have to start on page one and finish it. You can pick right. and choose what you want. You pick with that. Yeah. And let me put you on the spot a little bit because I, I haven't had the chance to read it yet. Can you give me a feel for maybe one or two of the stories in that book? How do they sure. sound? Sure, I can. So let me see. All right. Let's see. here. Okay. So what I could do, I'll read you some two, two beginnings maybe of stories. Um, here's one. This, this story is entitled Due North. And it starts this way. Daniel Troyer and Phage Croft have been walking farther and farther from the shapes of, the, of their neighborhood every day. The weather has warmed, evenings stay bright. After supper time, there is nothing to do at the dead end of Clover Street. Dirty dishes harden inside the kitchen sink at Daniel's house. His mother candy deep into reruns of Hollywood squares, gin, seven up and ice tinkling inside a metallic tumbler. She has a case on the center square, Paul Lind. By the time the lighted square is extinguished and the wide open pastures of an, another oldie, Bonanza, pan into view, the two friends will be nearly a mile away from their homes. Faye's father, Jeremy Croft, sits inside the house next door reading his feathered copy of the King James Version of the Holy Bible. The den where he reads is cave quiet, save the tick-tock of the mantle clock and the man's growling gut. His taste buds flickered and fizzled out when he lost his wife to breast cancer. He subsists now on God, pouring over verses every evening, black coffee plus three shots and several more of Jameson Irish whiskey by his side. I love the description of, of this as well. Do you ever find yourself, let me go back to this view, um, writing something and then having to remember that you wrote it before or do you ever duplicate, you know, like even that scene, you know, how, how you described yeah. it. Does that ever happen that you, you wrote something? I don't, I don't think I write the same things, but I have worried and I've talked to my, my critique group about this, that I do tend to write similar, similar settings and rural type characters. And I always worry about them. And they're like, don't worry about it. You know, everyone's like, it, they're different enough. So I think that's one thing writers sh should just not spend time worrying about. I mean, you got what you got. That's why pe I tell people, if you send something out and it's rejected, what difference does it make? You don't have anything else anyway. This is you. You got what you got. You put it out there and you can't do any more than that. So that's like why I said. And I like what you said, too, about not revisiting old stuff, you know, time, no. time to move forward. And along those lines, I got a feel for that. Can you share maybe from another short story a little bit of what it sounds like? Sure. The name of it is? So the name of this story in the book is called Scar. It's an old story, good girl lusts after bad boy. But this girl only wants a taste of the wolf in the woods, one lick even. Ash is a perfect name for him because God knows he is good at burning things up including hope in the chambers of his mother's heart and the family auto repair shop. What this girl doesn't know is that three years time, this boy will stroll into the lobby of the bank in the New Hampshire hometown of Longbread and set the cold barrel of a sawed off shotgun to the manager's temple, tender temple. She doesn't know he's going to turn out to be that kind of bad boy. So as you're writing it, you, do you kind of have the idea of where it's going to go? Do you outline it before you write it or just take it from the end? I wish I, I wish I was that kind of writer and some writers can do that. I'm unfortunately, uh, I never know anywhere I'm going. And this is why it's scary <laughs> for me. I just get a, a nib of an idea, a little tiny thought, and I just start and hope. I'm just, I feel like I'm hanging off a cliff a little bit when I write, but you know, so far it's worked out. <laughs> I haven't start, fallen. Do you ever start something and not finish it? Just yes, doesn't I out? have. I have. Yes, I definitely have. Not not a lot of things, and I'm still sad about those things. Um, but I usually don't keep them around. There's a few I've I've kept around, and they kind of they kind of sit there on my laptop like little ghosts, and they're sad. 
Um, but I, I've, I've accepted that sometimes I'm not going to be able to bring something all the way home. So we have the nonfiction, you have the poetry, you have this book out currently. Where do you see yourself going in terms of the future with the writing? Yeah, it's, I've thought about that myself. Um, and, and certainly, you know, having this, my own collection of stories is like a dream come true. So this is a huge thing for me to have this book. Um, and I've enjoyed the process. I, but I really, I really found that when I started working so much at, at writing, I really wanted to get published. That's really, I thought this would be, this would be wonderful. And I, and it is wonderful, but I found it to be a very uh, brief moment of joy. The real joy is just sitting with your fingers on the keys and flying with something. So my thoughts for the future is that I'm just going to keep doing what I do, writing sh short stories, writing poems, sending them out in the world for the fun of it. And maybe sometime I will be able to put together another collection of short stories. And I'm hoping those will be different from this one because I'm different than I was when I wrote these stories. You know, people people change. And so I'm hoping that my future um, collection might be more of a science fiction fantasy type of collection um, because I think that's where I'm going. I'm going into a place where my imagination is even getting further away from what I know. Um, and I think it's, it's just that I've learned to do that. You see a novel down the road? I'd love to write one. There's no idea that's ever set upon me that I felt had enough longevity that it that I that I thought I needed that much space to tell the story. And there's something very challenging about writing a short story and writing it well. You know, I'm, I'm a huge Hemingway fan. And why is that? Because that's you have you read one of his stories and you realize this is a master at telling you what what you could learn and maybe in an entire novel not that well in a short story frame. So it's kind of a challenge to me to write short stories. And you mentioned Hemingway, even some of his novels, you know, they weren't the thousand page novels, you know, which right. is kind of cool. He, he could really tell a story. If folks want to track you down, we mentioned a couple of different ways. One is perhaps the best bet is the website again. And that website is what? So it's Virginia and it's all one word, Virginia Watts, W-A-T-T-S dot com. Um, I'm on Facebook under my name, which is Ginny Pina, P-I-N-A. And all my books are the books that you can access them are on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and of course Devil's Party Press, who published this. You can always you can also look at Devil's Party Press, and I encourage people to do that because they have wonderful other books there that they have that they have published. And there's a collection of of uh, they also have an online a digital magazine called Instant Noodles, which has short. Uh, prose and um, and poetry pieces that are wonderful, and my book is available from Devil's Party Press, but many other wonderful writers as well can be found there. Is some of your short prose there as well? That what the site? You yes, I'm, I'm included in. I was a participant in some of the Instant Noodles uh, collections, and on my website you can get a sample of of my. You can read many samples of my work there as well. If you just want to pick up one poem or try out a nonfiction piece, it's you can find it there. Okay. And they also have contact information if they want to get in touch with you. Beyond and that contact well. me is on there and I'll I'll write you back. <laughs> one other one final question, I guess, as we're talking, it seems also you have a lot to give to would be writers as well. Do you do any teaching or have you thought of doing any teaching? Yeah, I you know it's a funny thing in 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 the writing world. You you kind of have an have to have an MFA to okay. to to be able to do that. I I, I understand that. I understand why um, places want that, but I, I kind of question it. I think sometimes um, I could impart some some ideas to young writers who don't have MFAs. I mean, I I'm an attorney. I'm not an M MFA, but I'm but I turned myself into a writer, and I've I've been able to to do fairly well in the publishing world. And I think I could I think I could you know I think I could I could give people encouragement ideas a place to start but it's it's difficult if, if they I, I don't know if i could well i'll give you one bit of encouragement if i can and that is um 
where you could start, and this is my background, have been teaching community college. You know, so most yeah. community colleges, or not most, but you don't have to have an MFA or, you know, or a continuing mm -hmm. education course, but it just seemed to be a natural, you know, given your background to be doing this. So hopefully- maybe we'll... I, I, So maybe I'll look into that. I think I'd enjoy it a lot. Yeah, I like, right. I love the company of other writers, actually. It's a great thing. Well, community college is certainly an option to, to look at. Anyway, I'd like to thank you for being my guest on this edition of the Blaine's World webcast. I also like to thank my um, producer, uh, Kathy Tassetti, and hopefully somewhere down the road, we may even bump into each other. Nice I hope so. I really enjoyed it. Thank you okay. so much for having me. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.